Hi, my name is Haley Luritsen, and I am an instructor in the Department of Social Work at Indiana State University. And I have a secret. I've lived almost every moment of my professional life um, with this secret, terrified that somebody is going to discover it at any moment. And I think that a lot of you watching this might also experience the same secret. So I'd like to talk to you about it today. And that secret is that I am a fraud. See, I spent my undergrad years studying social work. My master's is in social work. I am one semester away from getting my doctorate degree uh, at Indiana State University. I have spent years working with women and children who were survivors of sexual violence. I have spent time as a medical social worker working with men and women who have medical needs. I have worked in hospitals, home settings, nursing homes. I have volunteered at countless, countless places. I've presented at local levels and state levels and national levels and international conferences. I've worked in academia for more than five years. I've taught face-to-face -face classes and distance classes. I've taught through a pandemic, which, it's its own, which is its own category. I have excellent student evaluations and excellent peer evaluations. And at the end of all of that, I'm still a fraud. In fact, that's what I tell myself. And that's the feeling that I have every single day when I'm working. And it took me years to identify that that feeling had a name. And it was more than anxiety. And it was more than depression. It's called imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is that belief that you got to where you are by luck, by chance, not by skill or hard work, but that if at any moment people really knew you, they would find out that you're not where you're supposed to be, that you're a fraud, just like I felt like I was. But I'm not alone, and in fact, there's some very amazing women in high-powered positions who also struggle with imposter syndrome. The amazing Maya Angelou said, I have written 11 books, but each time I think, uh-oh, they're going to find out now. I've run a game on everybody. They're going to find me out. The amazing Michelle Obama said, imposter syndrome doesn't go away. It's that feeling that you shouldn't take me that seriously. What do I know? I share that with you because we all have doubts in our abilities about our power and what power is. There are some common characteristics that are associated with imposter syndrome. Characteristics like generalized anxiety and depression, a lack of self-confidence, perfectionism, linking your own self-worth to your abilities, this idea that we get so frustrated when we can't meet our own self-imposed standards. And imposter syndrome disproportionately affects women and minority groups. In fact, those individuals with, um, that are in a minority group oftentimes are more triggered by the imposter syndrome because of the microaggressions that they often feel. Microaggressions such as, you'd be really pretty if you lost some weight, or you've worked really hard to get where you are for someone like you, you must be proud. Things like that really play a role into the way we feel about ourselves because imposter syndrome already makes us feel as though we are a fraud. And when other people use microaggressions to passive aggressively make positive remarks towards us, which are actually negative in nature, it just feeds into that emotion that we're not where we're supposed to be. There was a study done in 1978 by Clance and Imes that categorized people that fall into imposter syndrome into two different categories. Category one has a sibling or a close relative that was somebody who was deemed as the intelligent one, while you, the person struggling with imposter syndrome, was deemed the sensitive or the emotional one. And in part, the person that struggles with imposter syndrome really wants to disprove this. So they work very, very hard in their academics. They get high achieving scores and high remarks from all of their teachers. 
They do so in hopes that their family will give them the recognition that they, in fact, are the intelligent one. Meanwhile, their families oftentimes don't give them the credit for being the intelligent one and still put that uh, label on the sibling or the close relative, even though their academic performance may have been quite poor. At the end of the day, this person, the imposter, feels conflicted with their drive for validation, but secretly they start to think that their family might be right. They start to feel like maybe they've only gotten the grades that they've gotten or done so well because of their level of sensitivity to the expectations that were put on them by their teachers or their peers. Maybe it was because of their social skills, their charm, or their charisma. The second group that uh, falls into um, common imposter syndrome characteristics, this person was deemed by their family as the intelligent one. In fact, they have superior intelligence according to their family. There was nothing that this person can't do and they do everything with ease. Everything they tried to do came so easy to them. But as they start to get older, they start to notice that there are things that they struggle with and things don't seem to come easy. In fact, they have to work quite hard at everything that they do. So then they start to question the validity of their parents' uh, fame when their parents would start to tell stories of how amazing and, and smart this person was, this imposter was. They tell stories of how early they walked and how early they talked and how smart they were at learning different things. But when they get to school age, they start to realize how difficult it is. And so then they start to doubt if they can trust their parents' judgment of them because things aren't so easy. In fact, it's pretty difficult. And they measure their success based on the level of ease in which things come for them. So if this imposter has to work very hard at something and they don't overachieve at it, they often consider themselves to be dumb. They have the idea that if they're not a genius, then they must be stupid. These two groups of imposters um, are, were found in 1978 and are still true to this day. In fact, most people that struggle with imposter syndrome would fall into one of those categories. So I would ask you, do you fall into one of those categories? Can you see yourself in one or the other or maybe parts of both? So with all of that being said, what do we do with all of this and how does that fear of having imposter syndrome impact us and the work that we do? Well, those that struggle with imposter syndrome run on autopilot. In fact, having imposter syndrome often creates actions that are just driven into us that create this autopilot. We live in constant fear and worry that we're going to be discovered as the fraud that we feel like we are. That worry oftentimes is translated into limiting what we do and how we push ourselves to succeed. We are afraid of sounding stupid, so we don't say anything. We're afraid of saying the wrong thing, so instead we say nothing. We don't want to be offensive, so we stay silent. We don't speak up when we should in terms of opportunities for social justice, social advocacy, or even our own promotions and advancement in our careers. We're afraid and we worry constantly then what we say or how we say it is going to make us vulnerable and vulnerability leads to us being outed as the fraud that we think we are. In fact, it paralyzes us to speak up on any of those important issues because we feel like we are unqualified. That constant worry that we live with tends to lead to higher rates of professional burnout. We feel as though we don't deserve a break. We have a point to make. We have something we have to prove. And if we stop and take care of ourselves, then we're afraid of how that's going to look or that people are going to discover that we're really not putting in the amount of effort we feel as though we should to be validated for the work that we do. 
women who lack self-care have a higher rate of burnout. And living through a pandemic is hard enough as it is, but it was said that burnout is gonna be the next global pandemic. Everything that we've been going through over the last year and a half has led to higher rates of professional burnout. We're doing multiple things, having multiple roles, wearing multiple hats, and those that struggle with imposter syndrome feel as though we can't let our guard down. We can't ever allow anyone to see the internal struggle and the worry that we have because again, we don't want to be discovered for the fraud that we think we are. So how do we overcome this feeling? How do we overcome dealing with imposter syndrome? Well, one of the most important things we have to do is take care of ourselves. Somebody who struggles with imposter syndrome has to give themselves permission to take care of themselves, to take those breaks, to take care of ourselves, to rest, um, and to give ourselves permission to take care of our own needs first. We also have to be willing to be vulnerable, which is really hard for somebody who struggles with imposter syndrome. We don't do vulnerability well. We tend to put up these walls and these barriers to protect us from letting anybody in to see the true self that we feel but we have to break the silence and we have to challenge that internal dialogue in our minds. We have to argue back at that negative talk that we feel in our head when it comes in and we start to doubt ourselves and we start to feel that negative emotion rising up inside of us that we got to where we are because of luck or by chance or that we don't deserve everything that we've gotten or that we've got to where we are, not because of hard work, but just because of consequences or, or chances of fate, right? What I like to do is I write out the positive talking points about myself, and it sounds a little silly, but having a list of all the things that we have done and accomplished, the hard work, the efforts, everything that we have put into our careers and our goals and our families and our you know, aspirations, everything that we've done, write it out on paper, read it to ourselves, think of it, talk about it, memorize it. And then when those negative thoughts start to come into our minds, we use those things, that script, to argue back against it. We use facts instead of feelings. We use the truth instead of the lies that we're telling ourselves. And maybe you're watching this and you are lucky enough to not be like me. Maybe you're somebody who doesn't struggle with imposter syndrome. But I guarantee you, you probably have somebody in your life that does. And so what can we do to help other people? Well, the first thing is we need to be advocates for each other. We need to support each other. We need to support other women in higher powered positions and the roles that they have and how they got there and the hard work and, and be advocates for one another. We need to recognize some of the common reassurances that often come from others. We say things like fake it till you make it or lean in, you know, to lean into the uh, issues, lean into the vulnerability. We want people to step into that uncomfortability so that we can support them, but we oftentimes don't want it for ourselves. So as somebody who can help others, we can start listening for those types of things that people say and encourage them and support them and reassure them that they got to where they are based on the hard work, the dedication, the support of those around them and we can have a huge role in helping each other. The other thing that we can do to help people is to identify imposter syndrome at an earlier age. The earlier someone identifies that they have imposter syndrome, the easier it is for them to fix it. If we can start talking about this at a much bigger level and not just hiding those feelings inside that we're struggling with, if we can be vulnerable and share with each other the struggles that we have, 
in terms of feeling unworthy of where we are, but rather support each other in the roles that we have and the work that we're doing, we have a much better chance of changing a younger generation from struggling with imposter syndrome. Thank you.